Well, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this very rare and special podcast. We have exclusively a guest that I've known for a long, long time on a personal and business level uh, for many, many years. He's been a faithful and loyal brother in many ways, and he's graciously um, come on to our, our podcast today to share some invaluable information insights as it relates to the global reset and coming at it from a very different perspective from a stock market a bond market chart analytical perspective for those who kind of need that type of uh, approach to better help understand why they should get involved at this late stage of the game of the global reset. Uh, we've asked, he's asked us to keep his anonymity for obvious reasons as he works for one of the largest and most prestigious uh, securities firms in, in the world. And he has a very high up position and he's been gracious enough to come on and join us today to help us out. So. Please welcome to the program, my friend B. B, thank you for joining our podcast. Uh, great to be here, John. Honor to have you, brother. Okay, so our audience likes how we're succinct with our questions and with the information. So I'll just jump right in uh, at, at a grassroots level. So firstly, uh, can you talk a little bit about to the audience, your research, uh, your background in the stock market and, and how and why it's applicable specifically for the global reset? Uh, you bet. Uh, again, thanks for allowing me to be on your program, John. Uh, I think we both agreed after our conversations that your audience might get some benefit from some of my research about the stock market and the oncoming global econ economy meltdown, which intersects somewhat with your timing of the reset. Uh, first, let's talk about disclaimers. Everything I'm about to say is not financial advice. I'm not a financial market or macro expert. This presentation is all based on a culmination of what other market experts have said and my own personal research. And I believe that those listening may get some insight on some predictions that may, diff may be different from what they've read in the headlines recently or in the mainstream media. Uh, for example, for months now, we've been hearing from pundits so-called experts and analysts calling for a recession and a stock market crash. Um, but if you've noticed over the past several weeks, the stock market has been completely the opposite. Generally, when the sentiment is so dire, it sets the stage for completely the opposite to happen. Fair enough. So if I understand you correctly, are you talking about a stock market rally? And if so, how could that happen when the economy is going into a recession or actually really a depression? I think we're kind of in a depression at this point, people being laid off, businesses closing, you know, banks capsizing and failing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I have to agree that the economy is failing, but that doesn't mean that the stock market can't rally during a time when the economy is imploding. It's my belief that not only will we have a rally in the stock market, but I believe it'll be a blow off top rally where we could see gains that necessarily take three to four years occur in three to six months. And as the rally takes hold, it'll steepen. Hmm. So how is that possible? Where, where's the money gonna come from that will fuel the stock market to an all time high and blow this top off or the melt up rally you always talk about? Well, that's an excellent question, John. Uh, I believe it starts with the Fed. Uh, I believe that the interest rate, uh, the interest rate uh, hiking cycle is done. So mm -hmm. as people wake up to this fact and institutions, it is a catalyst to be even more bullish on the market. People, institutions that were on the sidelines or even betting against the market will begin putting their money to work, thinking that a new uh, bull market has started. So some of the advancement will be in what people in the industry industry uh, call a short squeeze. So that's a great point uh, that I want to kind of stop for a minute. So a lot of people hear these terms. They don't really it, we kind of throw them away terms. They really know what they mean. They sort of take them for granted or they just kind of put them to the side. What exactly is a short squeeze? Uh, good question. Oh, uh, well, when you buy a stock, you're betting that the stock will appreciate. And when you sell shorts, it means that you're betting that the stock will go down. 
Notice how I said sell short. Mm -hmm. When you short a stock, it's really an agreement with the brokerage house where they lend you the stock. And when you're ready to sell your position, your short position, mm -hmm. to do that, you have to buy the stock. So in the event when the stock is going up rapidly, there may be people who own short positions on that particular stock that want to get out because as the stock is appreciating, they're losing money. So in order to get rid of their position, they have to buy the stock. So you have people who are buying the stock, letting it will go up, along with those who are buying the stock, trying to get out. And all this buying, trying to get into and out of that stock at the same time is what is called a short squeeze. And, and as you can imagine, it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. Right, fair enough. Well, I guess that would account for some of the upside, but where is the money coming from as most Americans are strapped for cash right now? Um, another good point, um, that, that's very true. But you know, there's still a lot of money that was printed during the COVID crisis that's still in the system. Institutions have a lot of money, hedge funds, 401ks, pension funds. And as things get bad in other places in the world, like Europe, you'll see uh, them wanting to place some of their money in the cleanest, dirty shirt in the hamper here in the American stock market. So as the sentiment begins to change to positive, you will see more people, institutions, get onto that bandwagon, which will drive the stock market even higher. And then, and then you're going to have FOMO, the fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. And that'll take hold when people see the stock market continuing to get to new highs. And they'll want to participate. And unfortunately, they'll probably buy in uh, close to the top, as they always do. And, and another thing that you'll see that um, will be indicative of something like this is uh, right at the top, you'll see news articles, experts touting the market. It's going to the moon, a new bull market cycle. And, um, and what I think this is, and a lot of uh, you know, uh, macro uh, contrarians believe uh, that this will be the end of a 42 year bull market cycle that started shortly after Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 21.5 in June of 1981. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so with that in mind, what do you suppose is the time frame for all this to occur? Well, I think the block top rally has just started and will continue probably for the next three to six months. May take longer, may take shorter, but I believe the market will hit its crescendo uh, in 2024, well, most likely the first part. Of it. First part of 24, okay. So then what happens? Um, the stock market will go down uh, 80 to 90% in a global deflationary buff, much like the Great, De uh, much like the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. The stock market's going to go down at least 90%, which will uh, line up with what I believe is gonna happen. Uh, but, but you're saying that we'll have a huge market rally up before that happens, correct? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so let's let's presuppose that that timeline is correct. What is your time frame for the blow off top early and then the global bust ultimately? Well, I believe the rally again started at the end of this October, and I believe it, it will last. It may last until the first quarter of 2024 or early in the second quarter of 2024. Okay. And approximately how high do you believe the rally can go? Well, I think the stock market may go up 30 to 50% here, which is a crazy number, you know, even maybe even higher. Hmm. Before we continue, uh, there was a question I wanted you to kind of enlighten for our members as well. Again, in one of those terms that people hear a lot about, but they don't really necessarily understand the significance of it. You've kind of educated me over the years in our conversations. I'm referring to the S&P 500, which we know is the standard and poor's. You've always uh, told me adamantly over the years that, that we need to watch for that and for a certain number. Can you talk about why you say that and what that number represents? Um, yeah, it's just a, basically a conglomeration of 
you know, the 500 companies, uh, you know, that's kind of in, in an index. And um, I believe that that's the, uh, that's the index that, you know, a lot of the, you know, market makers, um, hedge funds, um, institutions uh, follow and, you know, you know, put money into. And um, I, I believe that the Fed, you know, will do everything in their power, you know, not to make, you know, uh, make that particular uh, index fail. And currently right now it, it's about 4,500. Mm -hmm. And um, before the market meltup, meltup started about, uh, like I said, two or three weeks ago, it was down around 4,100. So it's had quite a, uh, you know, quite a good advancement since that time. Mm -hmm. And again, so currently it's about 4,500, but I believe, and some of the market contrarians believe that it could get all the way up to, you know, 6,000, uh, maybe even 7,000 before, you know, it, it's exhausted. And, uh, you know, we go into the, the bus phase. So for you, that number is kind of an indicator of the bust, the blow up happening ostensibly. Right. Okay, thank you for that. So if you were to put yourself in someone's shoes that's listening, how would you recommend that they invest in the market as you see it? Well, before we get to that, I, I want to discuss, um, you know, like um, maybe the time frame of it. You know, we're probably going to, you know, have to ask, you know, uh, maybe some of your listeners are probably maybe wondering, um, will this happen before the election? You know, will the bust happen before the election? And um, to answer that, um, if it, if if the bust is not completely done before the election, I I believe it'll be well on its way. Uh, I mean, I think I I think the government's going to try to do everything in their power uh, to keep the stock market. Um, up before the election, but I don't. I don't think they'll be able to do it. Right, right. I and I agree. As the market is imploding, will the Fed be cutting interest rates then? Uh, you better believe it, because it will be a global event. I believe that you'll see central banks across the globe cutting interest rates dramatically and printing on a unprecedented uh, scale. It will make the amount our government has printed over the last four years seem small by comparison. And uh, again, I think what's expected uh, from some of these macro uh, contrarians is like just for the US, 20 to 30 trillion in, in that time. Okay, so then with that in mind, do you believe the dollar will collapse then? You, you know, that is a really, really good question. Uh, because you'd think, well, you know, the dollar's just going to implode. But during the bust, ironically, I think it'll do well uh, during this period since, uh, er, you know, as past, in the past, everybody has run to the dollar and uh, U.S. Treasuries for safety. So I think for a, a while there, uh, yeah, the dollar will uh, appreciate during the bust. Hmm. So then what do you suppose will happen after the global bust? Again, this is interesting and maybe something that your audience hasn't heard of before, but um, because of all the money printing to, you know, reliquify the market, um, we most likely will have a market rally, but I think it'll be short lived and we'll never reach the all time highs in the blow off top rally. And then shortly after the global bust, you'll see inflation set in because of all that uh, money printing. And I believe it will be in the 25% range in the, in the years following the bust. Uh, and it'll be inflation like we've never seen before here in the US. Yeah, yeah. I also believe that we'll, uh, uh, th that'll set the stage then for uh, a new commodity sur super cycle for mm -hmm. precious metals, oil, energy, um, agricultural pro products uh, will have huge moves. The government will have to abandon or, or drastically cut social programs like Social Security, Medicare, 
in every other entitlement program because they'll need every cent to service the country's massive debt from all that printing. Pension funds will most likely uh, be broke and the government will not have enough stuff to fund them. You know, very, very scary stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with all that being said that you've kind of the picture you've painted, do you have any uh, targets for those specific commodities? Well, I don't, but the people I listen to do, and I know they're they're not, I mean, I think even though they're massive numbers, I know they won't quite sync up with, you know, what you, you said on some of your, you know, some of your uh, programs, but mm -hmm. I think gold will go up to 20,000 by the end of the decade. Uh, silver at 400, uh, oil, uh, $400 a barrel. Wow. Sorry, we, we kind of lost, lost, we lost you a little bit there. What you've uh, talked about, John, but you know, it's what the, what I, what the experts I listen to say. I'm sorry, you, you cut out a little bit. Can you repeat that again, please? Yeah, I, I was just saying that uh, I know it's lower than your targets, but that's what the, the experts I listen to say. Okay. How long would you suppose, let's say that oil does reach, because I do I do think once a straight, as I told my followers that I believe once the straight of Hormuz gets blocked here pretty soon, we're gonna see oil at $150 a barrel, no problem. Then it'll just skyrocket from there with hyperinflation. How long do you think if it reaches that three, $400 a barrel uh, amount, you, how long do you think they'll stay in place for roughly? I have no idea. You know, I, I think, um, you know, after the global bust, um, you know, I, I think it'll just continue to go up because, um, you know, the, the, the globe is still going to need massive amounts of oil, but as uh, a lot of these geopolitical events that, you know, take place, like, you know, like you said, the, um, the blocking of the Straits of Hormuz, um, you, you've got, you know, people, or, or, you know, like, uh, we haven't really, probably for the last 10, 15 years, we haven't put any money into the infrastructure for for oil. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's been, I, I don't think there's been a new refinery built in the U.S. since the 1980s. Wow. So it, it sets the stage that, you know, the world is still, you know, a lot of people think that we're going moving to the green energy, but um, that's really not the truth. The, the demand in, in oil is still, you know, climbing, even with all these new, you know, policies. And it will continue to do so. So given that, and, you know, given that fact, and some of these geopolitical events that you've talked about really set the stage for, um, you know, uh, oil and precious metals to really, you know, appreciate greatly, massively. Okay. So with everything that you've shared just now, how would you advise, uh, understanding that you're not a financial advisor, how, how, how would you advise a person to invest going forward and how have you invested yourself personally? Well, yeah, it's, you know, how I would invest personally is probably different than, um, you know, what your audience members uh, would do. And again, I, I can't give that type of advice. Mm -hmm. But one thing I, I, I might do is, um, you know, just give your audience a couple of things to think about, you know, as, as you know, like some questions that may be viable, you know, coming up. Like, how would you invest your money if you knew the stock market was going to lose 90% of its value in the not too distant uh, future? Mm -hmm. What would you do? if you knew there would be no social security, um, Medicare or any other entitlements? What would you do if you knew your, uh, your pension might not exist at some time in the future? What other investments would you need to have knowing that the dollar would be worth half of its value today or more and eventually becoming worthless? You know, we've been taught to invest in a certain way because we, because of because of the belief that system that's always served us, and the the only thing we really know, 
was always there. But what if suddenly it wasn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. Uh, wow, that's a pretty comprehensive overview of everything. And, and we could kind of touches on a lot of the subject matters we've talked about. Is there anything else additionally you can think of that you'd want to share with the audience or any last parting words or considerations? Yeah, I think uh, we should go into, um, you know, how um, how people can pr protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you've been very good about helping your listeners by recommending them to buy friends, you know, to buy currencies, to take advantage of the upcoming RB, um, you know, the Chinese railroad bonds, certain cryptocurrencies, metal metals. I think you're a firm believer of owning gold, silver, and copper. Right. You know, um, I'm not sure if, you know, people know this, but in Roman times, a soldier, you know, his pay, uh, a Roman soldier, soldier could feed, clothe their family, and pay all their bills for close to four ounces of silver per year. And after the Weimar uh, Weimar hyperinflation in Germany, after World War I, uh, you could purchase a mansion for only five ounces of gold or, or about 150 ounces of silver. And I, I, I believe we'll see things like that happen again. Uh, also, I think having a vocation, a skill, uh, will be very important in the upcoming years, like uh, being an electrician, plumber, farmer, carpenter, machinist, things that people need that a AI and robotics will not be able to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're young, uh, you may want to think about getting a skill rather than an overpriced, uh, worthless degree. Uh, I know you talked about getting your make a garden and grow some of your own food. Maybe it would be wise to do some prepping, store some food, have water. I know you've talked about a lot of this, a way to keep warm if you don't have any heat, uh, you know, an electrical grid goes down. Um, I think being debt free will be a huge advantage going forward and may help you afford some of the opportunities when the market goes bust. I mean, you don't have to go crazy, but when you can think about the worst case scenario and see if there's anything you can do to prepare uh, to make that better. Yeah, totally agree. That's a great, great summation. So I always talk to our listeners about the bartering and, you know, whatever skills you have sometimes, you know, you may not have a lot of money or you may not have gold or silver, but maybe one of your friends does and they can part with some of it because you have skills that they don't, whether that's sewing, knitting, or, you know, building, repairing cars, things of that nature that are, are really come in handy for them. People will, will definitely barter for that. People will work with their friends and family to find a way. I mean, that's what my, uh, as I've told people before in the past, that's what my grandmother did in the 1940s uh, with her neighbors. And I believe we're going to see uh, a modern adaptation of that because as we know, history repeats itself constantly. So this is, this is really great. Uh, I really thank you, uh, B, for your time. And thanks for your knowledge and your indispensability of information. And I, I just pray that uh, a lot of our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. And if they haven't taken action, they will get to it now. And if they have, they'll work to improve their position. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and I will talk to you later, everybody. God bless.